Tudo bem? Graças Hello. a Deus por mais um tutorial. Como você? Eu thank o Lord por um outro tutorial. Nesse livro agora, o livro de Daily Food, nós estamos vendo um livro especial, que é que Deus chose you. That's right. God chose you for a marvelous plan, and today we'll be covering a little bit on week two, which entitled, entitled, Spiritual Blessings in the Heavenly Places. So here we'll be developing a little further this subject, this general subject, God's choosing by looking at the experience of the Ephesians, the experience of the Apostle Paul, and also the Ephesians who really sink in the Word of God at the church at Ephesus. God was able to have a very substantial advancement in terms of leadership, of advanced work, of missionaries being sent. So we'll see a little bit of that on this week, okay? In general terms, Monday we look back the few weeks, the few points we saw, some interesting things. It's important first of all always to review those aspects. And then after from Tuesday through Friday, then we enter a little bit on the background of the church in Ephesus. What was the city in Ephesus? Who were the who the Ephesians were? How this church was raised? And here, sir, there are some marvelous and important details that the Apostle Paul left for us. Also, his heart, his person. What did he do? How he faced some situations ahead of him. And on Saturday and Sunday, we enter in first verses, verses one and two of the Epistle of Paul to the Ephesians. Okay, speaking basically on the person of the apostle. The apostle is a sent one, and also the concept of the church. What is the church? What is the foundation of the church, the ground of the church, and grace and peace, and sanctification also. We'll see in these two days, okay? So on Monday, the title is The Great Mystery of the Universe, Christ, and the Church. And we identify that we know this mystery through the word of the Lord. This arrivals to us a bunch of meanings in our lives. So here in this general subject of God chose you, as to realize that uh, we have a mystery to be unraveled in the Bible, which is Christ and the church. Everything in our lives is related to Christ and the church. God's choosing, he made by choosing you and me, is related to Christ and the church. So uh, a couple of points that we will remember on Monday. Let us remember that we came from the Gospel of Matthew, we entered, we are entering now in the book of the Ephesians. This is a continuation, and then in the end of the earth experience of the Lord, physically, in person, with his disciples, the Lord wanted to train his disciples to live based upon, no longer in his physical presence, but on his invisible presence. So we see that today, you and I, we don't have Christ, our dear, beloved Lord, in person with us. But we have His invisible presence through what? Through the Word. So the prophetic Word brings the reality of what He is, His very person, His feeling, His virtues, into our lives. So the Word, the Spirit applying the Word, the Spirit bringing this reality to us, we can prove that and know our Lord more and more. Another subject that was also covered here regarding the offerings of what your riches it is a subject that you cannot overlook them because it is blessing for us so certainly the lord is supplying me and you not for our mere enjoyment of course there is an, a share for our livelihood for our personal care but no doubt the lord is giving us chances to give something extra to him to honor the lord with our material possessions this was a very strong matter last week remembered here on monday and finally the matter of the building of the church so the church christ to god charged christ to build up the church you and i were also chosen to build up the church this is our function and the building up we see the end of it god's desire then with the building if we are serving for preaching the gospel we will be those overcomers and will be partakers in this wedding feast. So Christ in the church is a wedding. The marriage of the Lamb, the, the Bible tells us in Revelation 19, so there we'll have also participation in this wedding. We'll be marrying Christ, who is our Lord. And this church built up that raised the overcomers who is strong, is ready 
sanctified with no spot, no blemish, no shortcomings, it is a pure and holy church. It is a church that is prepared with the garments ready for wedding. And individually, we also need to be prepared to sanctify ourselves through the word that will be seen this week also to meet the, the Lord, not in a random way, but in a prepared way. When this happens, of course, the Lord will rapture the overcomers. Here speaks a little bit of the end times, right? Here we also see the example of Daniel that cutting that statue without the help without the assistance of hands and the, the statue represents the human government and the stone represents Christ in the church on the other on the one hand Christ but on the other without Christ he cannot have something built up so this uh, stone will dash the statue and that the, and then the, the church will be built up and then the heavenly government will come on earth and we'll be entering the millennium. At the end of times, we have the great tribulation in the last three years, and a, three and a half years of this age. The great tribulation, and after it, we have the battle of Armageddon, with the overcomers will be overcoming together with Christ. The Antichrist, the beast, false prophet, they will be cast into the lake of fire. Then we have a thousand years together with the Lord, those who overcame, who paid the price today, they will be for a thousand years reigning with the Lord. During this time, Satan will be arrested, and in the end of the 1,000 years, he will be freed to try to convince part of the nations who will be on earth to rebel against God, and we will have the last great battle, Gog and Magog, on the great white throne, which is the final judgment of God. There, those who are not written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire, and then the Jerusalem to eternity, this marriage will last forever. Nothing will separate us from the Lord. Thank the Lord. This is a quick overview, but it's something that we have seen in previous weeks. So you can include and go back to that material to go deeper if you want to. Okay? And then, on Tuesday, here we have a little bit of the background of the church in Ephesus. How the church was formed and raised. So Ephesus was a most important city in Asia Minor, which today it is today's Turkey. So we can have three, see three large cities from a commercial standpoint: Corinth, Ephesus, and Italy, a country. The three poles, so to speak, were very relevant in that region for commercial purposes, especially. And then Paul understood that there was room. And because of its commercial relevance, of course, the flow of people was very great, too. And Paul used that situation. He was a strategist before the Lord to find a place with people who were able to be sent from that region to other regions. And then, as we see here, he started a, an outpost uh, evangelical uh, place especially in Asia, those cities that we see in, in Revelations 2 and 3, including was raised through this center. We want the, these. This was his intention as well, the, those churches in Asia to be raised. This, in fact, happened. So he remained there for three and a half years, three years. Three years. It was a long period. Paul did not stay that long in those cities, but there he remained for three years. And also in Corinth, which is another neighboring city, we have two epistles to the Corinthians, which are related to these brothers and sisters who lived in Corinth. It was another relevant city. There, there were the Ismic Games, similar to the Athens uh, Olympics. So a lot of people went to that region. And there he found a couple, Priscilla and Aquila, who had the same office of uh, building tents, and Paul worked uh, building tents with them. So it's important that I will say here, I would like to shine in your eyes some names of people, both from a positive and negative standpoint, for us to draw some lessons. This couple, Aquila and Priscilla, here is a reference that are very famous and important co-workers of the Apostle Paul. I hope that today may the Lord find couples in the church life who cooperate with the Apostle as well. 
pela proximidade, pela comunhão que eles tiveram. And because it's close, the fellowship that they were, had, Paul then took Aquila and Priscilla to Ephesus as well. This is on his second journey. And then I have another name here. I said to you that I'll, I'll be mentioning some names. And when you read it, it's important for you to remember those points here. In Ephesus, last year there was somebody, a Jew, called Apollos. This is a name for us to also keep in mind. What is the point here? Apparently, he was a good person, had eloquence. He spoke the word of God in a way that convinced a lot. But the problem is that he was not in line with the prophetic speaking. He was not in line with the Apostle Paul. For the Apostle Paul, God through the Apostle Paul was flowing out at that time. So the channel used by God to reveal his word was the Apostle Paul, and that caused a little bit of confusion in the church, especially in Ephesus. There was a point that Paul had to go to deal with that. So it's quite important for us to be careful with distractions, to keep us simple, obedient, and faithful, to be partners with what the Lord is speaking to us today, identifying the chant, the correct channel of his flow. Then on Wednesday, we began to look a little bit on the report that is in Acts 19, and Acts 20, also that we'll be looking at it. It's important for you to try to read the Bible to follow up those reports here. These are very rich. Here begins with a Paul, Paul Acts 19, 1 and 2, in verse, and then verse 8, a little bit of what he did, he lived the gospel of the kingdom. So in every opportunity he had, he used that to preach the gospel, the complete gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. So in Acts, in the end here, verse 8, 19, 8, he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. So we also need to have this habit of saying to people the things of the kingdom of God, kingdom, not missing the opportunities. The kingdom brings government of God to the people. So when you see people today, they're actually disconnected. Why? Because they're lacking the government of God. They're lacking the order of God, God's determination in their lives. That is why when the Lord Jesus came to earth, he looked at people, he saw that they were afflicted and weary Exactly, because they had no sense, meaning their lives, because of the absence of government of God. When government comes, there's order, there's determination, there's meaning in people's lives. That is why the gospel of the kingdom is quite important. Then the next verse, Acts 19.9, says, But when some were hardened, and then, so this explanation of the word that Paul is giving, some received and some did not. When some were hardened and did not believe, Look, this is a warning for us. When we receive the word of God, the gospel of the kingdom, we have to have faith, not a hardened heart, not disbelief, not criticism, but faith to believe in the word of God. Worse yet, they spoke evil of the way, that is, of the Christians of the, the, before the multitude. So he departed from them and withdrew the disciples reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. So he went out of the synagogue and went to the school of Tyrannus, which was the Greek philosopher, that was very common, discussing philosophies in Greece. Really like this kind of situation. And Paul have found some space, or rented a space there. He was there. He was ministering the word of the Lord there. That lasted two day, two years, for two years. He continued there for two years. We believe that in the daily food we read that there he he started a GPC to prepare trainees for GPCs, for missionaries, that were what we really said in the beginning for them to spread, to spread the word of God, the gospel of the kingdom, all over the earth. So the Lord there made amazing miracles through Paul, you can see that later, confirming the word. And this heart of Paul, of preaching the gospel, of creating a center of work, worked out. Uh, there were fruits, another name that I'll be mentioning to you, Epaphras. Epaphras, who was Epaphras? We believe by the biblical report who was one of those who went through the perf false perfecting in Ephesus. When we look at the book of Colossians, there's a greeting in Colossians 4, 12. 
Uh, about first who was one of you, a bond servant of Christ, which you always laboring fervently for you in prayer, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that the, the great zeal for you, and those who are in Laodicea, and those in Eurapolis. So Epaphras apparently was responsible to raise Colossi, the churches in Colossi, Laodicea, and Eurapolis. But praise the Lord, we we'll have this heart of raising people, raising leaders, missionaries to care for others. They also can spread the word of the Lord and take that on. Praise the Lord. On Thursday, in Acts 20, we have a few more lessons. Here, Paul speaking a little bit with the leading ones in the church in Ephesus. So in his third journey, Paul went out from Ephesus, he visited their churches, and then in the third journey, we're speaking of the second and the third journey, instead of coming down to Ephesus, he remained in Miletus. Maybe because he was in a rush, he wanted to go to Jerusalem, he stayed in Miletus, and then he called the elders from the church in Ephesus. The report, the word that Paul says to them, that was reported by Luke in Acts 20, it is quite interesting. Look at the heart of the Apostle Paul here. Acts 20, in verse... 17 through 19. You can see here, let me even follow it with you, it will be easier. You can see our in our daily food, okay, 18. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came to Asia, what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility. Look at his heart. This is very important for me and for you. Or have, in dealing with others, to be with all humility, with many. Simplicity, even Paul being someone charged by God, the authority of God established here on earth, he, he was treating, he's treating everyone with humility, with many tears and trials. He's not someone hard, severe with people, but someone who was uh, humble, crying. He was there with the saints, suffering with them. This is a great lesson because he's speaking here to this, especially to the leading ones sufferings which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. So when we preach the gospel, the missionaries, we are involved with the word of God and we take on a serious position, we and our family in serving God. Of course, trials come. God never said to us that they would not have those. On the contrary, Matthew 10, 16, he says the disciples went as uh, sheep in the midst of woes. So he, he knows that he promised that he would keep us here in the world so we can trust him very peacefully that he will protect us even if there are hard situations, heavy situations uh, make us uh, really, really disturbed why God allowed that but God is caring for us if we are serious and engaged in loving the Lord and his coming. And then in verse 20, also, there is another important point here. For it is not you who speak, but... It, sorry, it's Acts 20, 20. He says, uh, nothing that was... How I kept back, nothing that was helpful. So we have to use phrases that are helpful for them. Not a human study, not a eloquence. Have to release their spirit to let the word flow, to take the prophetic word, to apply it in our day to day of the saints, to work on this word, immerse on the word that we are seeing, or recently, never wanting to exalt ourselves or wanting to have disciples to be a politician or something like that. That was not Paul's heart, it should not be our heart either. Our heart should be to rescue people out through the word. And there, there are other matters also related in Acts 20, but I think it's important these few verses for us to really keep them in mind should to be our reality as well. So Paul was there in his dealing with the saints. He was in the school of Tyrannus speaking perfectly, but he was also from home to home. As you see in Paul's report, speaking, fellowshipping, eating with the saints, having a normal church life, living with them, which is what we need to have today. We have conferences, meetings, but we also have home meetings. We also have specific meetings 
for us to have more and more fellowship with one another. And then, on Friday, still continuing on Acts 20, here verse 28, also there is another verse which is key for us. This verse says, uh, verse 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Look at their responsibilities. Leading ones, the elders, the deacons, they have responsibilities in the church. We have to be very careful in what we do. Something is weighing on them because they are they are there with the church, relating to the church which was purchased with his own blood. God has blood. The church is not mine, not yours. It's of God, but it is under the administration and management of the deacons and the elders. So we have to be very diligent and dedicated to care for one another. Another verse also. Twenty twenty four. Paul's heart. You want us to also have this heart. Chapter 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. May you and I seek this experience and to help others to have this experience. Sometimes we consider life precious to us, our goods, our jobs, our human achievements, our feelings, our ideas. But how about if we seek before the Lord to enter ourselves and say, Lord, I don't want to consider anything precious to myself. I want to be happy, as Paul said, uh, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord. What is your ministry? Why do you do not identify, do not c complete your career and your ministry, the ministry the Lord gave you? You will not be able to be filled full. That is why Paul had hit this reality. For him, nothing else valid. He just wanted really to seek the things of God. So I praise the Lord for the experience of the Apostle Paul. Well, another point here also, verses 29 and 30 speaks of the woes who would come not, not sparing the flock, those savage woes. Let us not be like those savage woes. Uh, on the contrary, rather, we are here to care for one another. Uh, also, Paul said that from in the letters to the elders, this is in verses 31 and 33, the matter of covetousness. He says, I have not have coveted no one's silver or gold or a pearl. Be careful with riches and money. Sometimes we see some servants of God be led astray through that by being cared with obtaining advantage or storing up money. So let's be careful not to fall for coveting. Paul have coveted no one's silver or gold or a pearl. He served the Lord with simplicity, even uh, built tents. He did not want to depend on the saints than to be a burden to the saints, even though that would be a right that he had. In this portion also, uh, I have in uh, verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's, we see here his heart in a very organic way, without an ambition, with not wanting to uh, receive glory to him. He just wanted the gospel of the kingdom to be propagated. This is our heart also. We are not cared about beautiful words, beautiful message, being eloquent. See, Paul here, he had a conversation with much heart to the saints. Not worried about with the metrics and order. He really wanted to show there something very genuine which was within him. We're going to the end now on Saturday and Sunday when we enter in the first verses in the book of Ephesians. Apostle of Paul to the Ephesians. There's just one chronology, chronology here showing the initial part. On Saturday, Paul wrote the epistle to the Ephesians in Rome. He was arrested around 64 AD. Then, besides the epistle to the Ephesians, he also wrote 
Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon, okay? So was there, that was his first after his imprisonment and he was released. The next up, the Roman Emperor Nerus arrested Paul, and then 6 or 7. He predicted his martyrdom and wrote the epistle to second letter to Timothy. Well, the first verse is then. Let us read chapter 1, verse 1. Here we read, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus, and faithful in Christ Jesus. Here we already have, a, in a small verse, we have a lot of thing, important things here. First off, Paul, Paul, an apostle, he was not an apostle appointed by man. Apostle was, it's not appointed by man, actually. An apostle is appointed by God, he's chosen by God. God, through his fruits, he bears witness that he, the apostle, through the revelation of the word and the fruits that are produced through him, then God gives testimony. This is a warning for us because it doesn't depend on human choice. Uh, it's There's no point in having a consensus, oh, let's choose this one. No, because we are full of failures. Our heart is not the heart of God. Our choice, it's, uh, the choice must be according to God's will. This is a very important point regarding this first verse. What else do we have? Another part here. To the saints who are in Ephesus. This point to the saints. There is a, an improper understanding sometimes. What is to be a saint? Actually, saint here refers to those who were separated. It is a position. Like We can make a distinction between positional sanctification and this positional, subjective, positional, you went out from the world and you went to the church, went out from the empire of the darkness and went to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. This is a position. Your position today became saint, different, separated. This is a fact. When you believe in, in the Lord, you are taken out of the world. Now, it doesn't stop there. When you are taken out of the world, but still they have dirt, dirt. The old man inside of you is to have the earthly nature inside of you in your inner being. So there is a process now that you have to go through of sanctification inwardly, subjectively. Your person now has been transformed. Your inner being has been transformed. It is essential this process because it changes your nature, your posture. Sometimes you're surprised. Oh, how come I have this bad posture? Because the word still needs to sanctify you but still need to seek sanctification more subjectively to have this metabolic change. When we have this, we are tasting this sanctification, the more our mind is renewed. We thought on old things, on bad things, and vile things, but now we begin to experience the good, ple pleasing, and perfect will of God, which is in Romans 12, 1 and 2. So this comes with sanctification. And on Sunday, still a little more on sanctification, how to be sanctified subjectively. How can I in my day today to receive the sanctification, to realize that, oh, I'm closer to the Lord, I'm, I'm pure. Those elements, that natural load, it's terrible, disturbs us, prevent us from serving God, serve us, uh, spouses, children, professional relationships, sometimes we feel pride. So the secret here it is to be purified by the washing of the word through the word. This is in the book of Ephesians 5, 25, 27. So it is to change our diet to eat differently, to seek the word, word and more word for those natural things to be replaced by the holy items of God's holy nature, everything that is toxic, all the toxins harmful to be replaced by what is holy, pure, and good for us. Okay? So this is a transformation process through the Bible, the word of God, the word that we are hearing here that tells us on Sunday. And then, also another important portion that we saw here Verse 1, we see that to the saints who are living in Ephesus, what does that mean? 
uh, who are in Ephesus, in Ephesus, the church in Ephesus, it's important because God established a foundation, the foundation of the oneness, which is the church. There is only one in the universe, but from the standpoint of representativeness, there is its a location, which is the city. This is the proper grounds. So in every city, there is a church. That's why the church in Ephesus, Corinth, church in Thessalonica, so so on and so forth. So other references in the churches are church or cities. So when Paul says uh, to the saints who are in Ephesus, all the Christians who, who receive the word of the Lord are the church in Ephesus. Of course, there are some divisions, unfortunately, divisions, segregations, denominations separating us. But when we have this foundation, God can be revealed and to, to pour himself to us. We are expressing that question with much simplicity. God opened our eyes, so I pray the Lord for that. And then verse 2, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you who are hearing us in peace. What is grace? It is a present of God. Sometimes we see people spending much effort kneeling down, going upstairs on their knees, making great sacrifices and processions, but here we have to see that God wants to give us his life, his person, his attributes, freely. So this is grace. It is a gift through Jesus Christ to the Lord. That I don't have time here, but in Isaiah 55, 1 and 2, shows us much of God's heart, representing what grace is, which is God. So giving all his riches, everything that he is, his person. We have no need of anything other than that. Everything to satisfy us, to fill us, it is God. Through the Lord Jesus, through the Spirit, He is the Spirit today, we are, we are able to have access to these riches. And when grace is abundant in our lives, when we flow this grace to others and produce fruits, the result is peace. So everything is related. I want peace? Okay. Well, then I need to enjoy grace. I need to have access to the grace through the word. And I have the happiness. I have peace. Praise the Lord. The last phrase here says, May the Lord continue flowing his grace continually to each one of us. Hallelujah. I hope you understood a little more the word of God this week. And let's, until next time, see you later.